a, a ticking time bomb, mental health in Nigeria. Uh, we have already been introduced, so I would let us just jump right into the middle of it. So I would like to start with an, an essay I self-published uh, a few months ago. It's called A Poet Disappears. And it was an essay trying to examine what had happened to a Nigerian poet and medical student who was already, already, already on an incline, as it were, in terms of um, his literary prowess. Um, and it was a friend of mine as well. Um, well, we were friends on Facebook, and we would exchange works and writings and everything. And he was a few years behind me in medical school, and so I was very interested in his future. I was interested in what he would accomplish, given that uh, by 2012, he had already won the Saraba uh, Pen Poetry Prize. But um, somewhere along the line, this fellow disappeared. And when I say disappeared, I mean actual vanished from the consciousness of everybody. You couldn't find him on Facebook. You couldn't find him on social media. Medical school where he was at, the medical, um, fellow medical students who were in school with him could not account for him anymore. And that went on for at least two or three years. I mean, it practically disappeared in 2013. And this is 2019. Um, September, I wrote that essay just to kind of clarify what exactly has happened. And because the essay was written, there was a more rigorous inquiry as to what happened to him. And um, someone was able to get in touch with his family, with his sister specifically. And when they asked her, where is he? Do you know what she said? She said, he has traveled. Now the question is, how does someone travel away? Does he travel away from Earth or just travel and he's, he leaves no marks anywhere? He didn't finish medical school. He didn't finish, he, he didn't write any more poems or publish any more poetry. He was done on social media. Now, the bottom line is, this is not the only person, or this is not the first time people would say something like that. So, he traveled. That is vague. Doesn't really mean anything. And the truth about it is, on further inquiry, we found out that he was actually suffering from a mental illness. And that's where my first question is going to be. Why do we have so much shame about mental illness? Awa. Um, I was really hoping you wouldn't ask me. I think it's just so long. It's such a, where do we begin to answer the question from? Why do we have so much shame? I think on the one hand, it has to do with our history, you know, um, and I don't think it's just here in Nigeria. I think it's, it's global, um, understanding how the concept of mental health has evolved over, over the years. Um, from you know secluding people to asylums, then became hospitals and things. We already understand that there is an undertone of you know shame in the evolution of mental health. Now bringing it down to our culture or our climb, uh, th there's so much you know from the Nigerian resilience to our over religiousness to you know not wanting to talk about certain things that we we're supposed to talk about and just throwing things under sweeping things under the carpet as to say um so it's hard to answer that without also bringing in a bit of history a bit of um our idea of you know we're supposed to be fine and then if i'm not fine then it's evil spirits or it's what jesus used to cast away in the bible you know, those stories and all of that. And it's, it's just so hard. So I think it's just an interplay of history, religion, culture, and our social norms as well. Thank you for that. But in recent times also, on social media, and even in I mean, contemporary Nigeria, you have this movement now that is bringing out, it's talking about mental illness, and it's owning it really, as it were. And people are coming out and say, well, I'm not my diagnosis, I've got this, but that is not all that defines me. What, what is your own take on that as well? Do you think it's a resistance against you know, what used to be, and how do you think it will improve um, the perception of mental illness overall? I think it's a fantastic thing. So I always tell people that when I talk about mental health, I do genuinely believe that it's a narrative issue you know, beyond, of course, the reality of what it is and seeking support and all of that. When we talk about mental health in the public, it's a narrative thing. And when I think about mental health, I always say, um, or when we talk about stigma, 
or you know, shaming people into silence. I always say it's an incomplete story. You know, and I use a certain kind of example. I say, um, you can say, okay, Dami has depression. That's one, maybe one fact. And then you say, Dami stabbed his mother. And then somebody says it as Dami has depression, so he stabbed his mother. And then it can be two individual truths, but together, it's false. You know, so for me, it's about how can we retell these stories and understanding that when you ask an average Nigerian why, you know, why are you scared, about, um, scared of people who have mental health conditions, and they can't particularly tell you, like, eh, well, you know, like, it's how we've been conditioned. And the conditioning wasn't so obvious that they came to tell you that, hey, look, those people, you know, it was in our movies, in our music, in the news. And that kind of conditioning took a lot of time. So it's, for me, it's important that it's not just about the facts and the numbers and all of those things that we hear in isolation and in the air. It's about putting real people in front of the narrative. It's about looking at me and saying, hey, I live with a mental health condition and this is me. And then it becomes more human because we have made it this very abstract concept that it's always those people and then it's not any of us. You know, and it's about bridging that gap, understanding that it is all of us, you know, and when we put more faces and when people go on social media, which is so powerful today, when people go on social media and say, this is me, I'm living with this, it brings about conversation. Yes, it comes at a risk of backlash and all the other ignorant things we hear, but the important thing is that it is starting conversations, and that's what we've seen happen in, in the past three years. Speaking about conversations, Prof, uh, I remember a few years ago, I shared an essay by a Nigerian author in The Guardian UK, where he was speaking to the Nigerian resilience, and he more or less insisted that Nigerians don't have mental illnesses, that we are so strong. What do you think about that, sir? Uh, thank you very much. The, um, so I, th I think that was Chigozie Obioma. And um, he'd written a, an article for The Guardian where he implied without much research that um, the Western Europeans and North Americans were, I suppose, weak people, which is why there was a, an increased risk of suicide in, uh, in the West and, um, and, and that we are extremely resilient people, which is obviously quite false. Um, of course, all of us would like to be regarded as resilient. I mean, you know, most Nigerians wouldn't want me to say that we're as weak as everybody else because it gives you a, a good sense of self to be regarded as uh, more resilient than others. But, but the, the truth, of course, is that we're just human like everybody else um, and there's no good reason to think that given adequate stress, we're not going to be affected um, by, by the stress that we, we face on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think... Um, for today's purposes, I think we just start off on the kind of basic, on the, uh, kind of basic infrastructure of agreeing that we are human like everyone else, and that we are as liable to uh, all the frailties of all other human beings. Um, I, I, we can discuss whether or not there are variations in the uh, the numbers, and we can also discuss whether the variations in the numbers are determined by particular cultural aspects or particular things that we bring because of uh, the, you know, our, bio our biology, our genetics. But I think it's safer to just accept that we are all human and that we're all frail. Thank you very much for that, Prof. Um, you spoke about culture. And, and when you spoke about culture, I think I heard religion. Because when you think about the Yoruba culture, and even at the business level of it, the Yoruba nosology of classifying mental illnesses. I don't think the ICD-10 particularly has done far better, than, for instance. But now comes in religion and um, the role of both the Christianity and Islam in the shaping of the perception of mental illnesses. I mean, we are, let's even talk about uh, normal physical illnesses where in churches they pray against cesarean section because cesarean section is not a normal way of delivery as far as they're concerned. But I mean, that doesn't even make sense. When you now bring it to mental illnesses, it makes it even worse. We, I mean, I worked in, in Nigeria as a psychiatrist for at least six years, and my experience is that the hospital is the last place people would come to. When it's gone totally 
bad. That's when they come to the hospital. So please, could you speak to, 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 to um, the effect of um, religion on um, 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 mental? Yeah, um, I, I think, I mean, you're touching on something which is quite important, obviously. Uh, but um, I'm not um, inclined to just to want to say it's to do with Islam or Christianity. I think, I think um, certainly I can speak about Yoruba culture. So I think Yoruba culture, as well as uh, Islam and Christianity, have a, a bearing on the kind of, um, how shall we say, the, the kind of explanations, the explanatory uh, hypothesis that people have. So, so a, a simple, straightforward way of thinking about it is to say that if somebody was to say that they can hear a voice when there's nobody around them, in our culture, there's, uh, the, the first explanation is to imagine that the person is possessed. Therefore, uh, you are not likely to think that uh, that is something to do with a mental illness, or you're not likely to think that is something to do with something having gone wrong with a person's brains. If you were to see a, a, an elderly woman and, um, and somebody uh, put something on Twitter about three or four weeks ago, where there was an elderly woman somewhere in, 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 in Nigeria who was naked and looked as if she was blaming herself for being a witch. There was nobody trying to help her. There were you know, groups of about 30 or 40 people just standing around her. Because of course that particular narrative structure, the idea that uh, uh, an elderly woman might be a witch and that she might be responsible for the death of uh, other people's children sits within the cultural belief systems and, the, and people are not likely to understand what we might regard in technical terms, uh, we might call that a, 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 a delusion of guilt which the individual has and which is just part of, a, of an illness and if you were to treat the person they would be like the rest of us and they wouldn't claim to be, to be witches or anything of that sort. So I, I think I, I agree with you that uh, culture taking the manifestation of religion uh, has a lot to say, to answer for, with regard to how people perceive uh, some individuals with severe mental illness. I've always been of the opinion that in a country where you have more churches, mosques, and abbeys than hospitals, people are likely to go to those places instead of going to the hospital. Um, and for mental um, health and mental illness, it, it's about the same thing. Um, Awayu and I were having a conversation about um, the current law of the land regarding mental, mental health, um, or the legislation that we have, and it's, the, it's still the 1958 um, mental, mental Health Act, which was actually passed down to us from the British in 19, 1916 or 1914. Um, what do you think about that? And what, what, is the impact, what is the impact of that on, on our mental health or mental illnesses are viewed in our today? Um, so it's actually the 1958 Lunacy Act, just to rub it in. Um, so of course, nobody's gonna say, oh, I'm a lunatic, and like, what does that even mean in 2019? Um, so we've, supposedly come a long way when it comes to legislation or the evolution of mental health in Nigeria. But clearly, our law is still stuck somewhere in the pre-colonial era, or in the colonial era. And it is, and what we're really talking about is how, you know, my organization and many other organizations out there are trying to plug these gaps within the mental health system, providing support groups, providing, you know, community-based um, mental health care and things like that, but how all of that impact is sort of being capped because of unfavorable policy environment. Because we talked about things like rights. So if we go into a, a psychiatric hospital, for example, and you're going to maybe um, be an intermediary or mediate, you know, against maybe forced treatment, the truth is that the Lunacy Act agrees for that. Forced treatment, irreversible treatment, you know, you don't have legal capacity as a person who lives with a mental health condition, and things like that, that are today, in 2019, violations of international human rights. That is the truth. So what we have currently before the National Assembly which you would expect that it's 2019, some of these things are now in line with you know, human rights standards and conventions and treaties. We're still seeing sort of the same kind of language and the same kind of you know, um, patient-centered, not person-centered kind of 
mental health bill before the National Assembly. And it's so important because one of the things that I, I advocate for is when we always talk about experts, it's always very important that we do not forget or leave out people who are experts by experience. It is so important. You cannot make decisions about my mental health and the laws and the policies and the solutions without me being at the table to tell you what my needs are. And that's exactly what we're pushing for Nigeria to do, to ensure that whilst you want all the experts in the medical field to be there and every other person who is a stakeholder, ensure that there's adequate representation for people who have mental health conditions. Because when we continue to leave people out in policy making in Nigeria or mental health policy making, to be very specific, we are sort of fostering and reinforcing the idea that they don't know what they want. They are these people who are crazy. Let us quickly do something for them. And that is not what it is, you know. If you really think about people who perhaps are in that category, which I still find a very debatable topic, it's really, really a small minority of the group. A lot of people who have mental health conditions are people like you and I, just sitting here going about our lives and, you know, things like that. So it's very important that even in Nigeria, and we have a bill currently before the National Assembly, which we are gladly going to oppose, it is very, very important that with every step of the process in any kind of disability, including psychosocial disabilities and mental health conditions, people who have mental health conditions are actually at the table saying, this is what a good policy looks like for me. This is what a good solution looks like for me. I do have legal capacity. I can decide X, Y, Z, and, you know, and, and all, of, all of those things. So I think it's very important that we begin to push for it to be a priority. Um, I mean, it's 2019, guys, and it's Nigeria. We still have our law in 1958. How is that even possible? I mean, it's Nigeria. Anything is possible. <laughs> Prof, <laughs> Prof um, I mean, I recently moved to the UK and I started practicing psychiatry there. And, um, well, the best part of it, or the only part of it that makes me easy is the psychiatry itself, the core psychiatry. I mean, the, the whole system of laws around practicing psychiatry in the UK, for me, has really been heavy, the section two, the section three, the section 117, and all that. I'm still trying to grapple around it. But I sometimes ask myself this question, like, can, is autonomy something that we can give up, really, for, how do I call it now, for, to, for in terms of mental health treatment, is autonomy indispensable, really? Um, uh, it's, a, it's a complicated question you've asked me, so I'm going to try and um, I just have to try and deal with it in a very systematic way. I think the first thing to say, um, to, to, to emphasize what Hawar said, is that the, uh, the Lunacy Act of 1918, uh, which is the English and Wales law, is, has been updated thrice, three times in the UK since that act. So it was, it was uh, updated in 1959. Uh, it was, then there was a new act in 1983. And the 1983 act was updated, I think, about five or six years ago. So, so you can see that um, the Nigerian parliament has not responded, has not kept it. Essentially, if the British hadn't passed a law in 1918, Nigeria will still have no law dealing with the practice of medicine in the area of mental health or mental illness. So, so and the, um, the, the draft bill has been sitting in the, in, in the Nigerian parliament, in the Nigerian Senate, for close to 20 years. So it's not to do with the fact that the individuals who have expertise and have an understanding of what ought to be done haven't done their work. Is to do with the, that the politicians haven't done their work. They haven't discussed it. Uh, it hasn't gone through the necessary committee stages and so on. So I think we need to get that in place. Um, to come to the question of, uh, of autonomy, um, I, I always worry when we, um, when uh, you know, when I go to parts of the world outside of Western Europe and North America when people want to talk about um, autonomy as if it was um, only related to, to health care. So, so I, many years ago, about 20 years ago, I was invited to go and speak in Cairo uh, about uh, autonomy. 
and, and I prepared my talk in the usual way, and it was only when I was just about to stand up to speak that I suddenly realized that this is, a, it, I'm just a stupid person. How can I come to talk about autonomy in a place where the majority of the population don't choose who they marry, the women don't choose how they dress, there's no democracy so people don't vote, and, and my, uh, my, my host wanted me to act as if autonomy is a tiny little object which only relates to whether you agree to take a tablet or not. So, so I think it's uh, absolutely crucial that you recognize that a discussion about autonomy is a, is a deep discussion about uh, individual freedoms, about the recognition that, if, that humans are individuals. It's a recognition of the incredible importance of every single individual life. It speaks to the idea of having a, a dignity, having treating pe people with incredible and utmost respect. So it can't be, it can't just be pushed to one side and be regarded as a discussion we have to do with healthcare and, and so on. Um, but your real question, the real question you're asking me is whether um, autonomy as a concept works in the, uh, in the theater of mental illness, whether, whether it is possible, no matter how severely disturbed the person is, that we, I, I, we treat them as if they were able to make choices, because that's the real question you're ask, asking me. And, and I think that um, every jurisdiction in the world approaches this question in a different way. So if you were to fall ill in, uh, in Massachusetts, if you lived in Boston, and you were to fall ill, they would, they would detain you, but they wouldn't give you any treatment because you are not able to say yes to the treatment. And that seems to me to be invidious because it means that you could be detained for years on end because you can't be treated unless you were to agree to treatment. And in the UK system, the, you are detained irrespective of whether or not you have autonomy. So, so the detention is, is justified on the basis of the fact that you are likely to be of risk to yourself or you're of risk to somebody else or you're likely to neglect yourself such that you then are likely to die or be exploited. So, so autonomy in that system doesn't come into it at all because we're making judgments on whether or not you pose a risk to others or, or to yourself. So, so it's a complicated discussion. I don't think there's a, 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 a kind of decisive answer about it. I think you've done a very good justice to it, sir. Um, I mean, we can't talk about mental health without talking about the mental health service in Nigeria. And um, we have about eight psychiatric hospitals, eight new psychiatric hospitals, um, one for each zone, as it were. And you have also other places where mental health um, services are rendered. Um, but the most interesting thing about it is that the mental health service itself has either been in the tertiary or the secondary level of care. There is nothing in the primary um, level. I mean, I work in community psychiatry now in, in the UK, and what I'm experiencing is it's just what I've read in the books. In Nigeria, when we did community health, it just meant that we had like a fancy boutique clinic in Yaba where would be slightly richer patients come to you know, amenity clinic and that's it. So I mean, and this is not to say that work is not being done there, but the, the system, the sophistication of the service itself is, it leaves so much more to be desired. Um, and you've been a service user and you've spoken about um, the importance of, the, of including the service users and the experience. Could you just speak to the experience of, of um, um, using mental health service in Nigeria? Okay, so the backdrop to that, to answering that question is pretty much that yes, I am a person who lives with a mental health condition. I have lived with bipolar and post-traumatic stress disorder the past four or five years, uh, maybe more, but diagnosed three, four, five years ago. Um, and using services in Nigeria is quite complex, you know, because, I mean, and it's something that we're still having to deal with as an organization when people call and ask, where do I go to? You know, because somehow when you think about health and you think about hospitals, somehow when you think about mental health, you don't think about going to hospitals. Um, so as somebody who, at the time when I knew that I needed to seek some sort of support, 
I, too, I wasn't quite sure where to go, you know. Um, and in my own time, like I always tell people, like, I feel like I didn't have the luxury of denial because I was already suicidal. Um, so I, I took myself to neuropsychiatric hospital, Yaba, and I got help there. Um, but I got help on private time, which meant that I had to pay for private time, which was about um, 15,000 naira for a session, which is typically about an hour, an hour, 30 minutes. And then when you look at that, and at that point, I was seeing a psychologist. And he got to a point where after the initial assessments and all of that, he realized, you know what, this is quite a deep issue. You're going to need to see a psychiatrist because we're going to need medications because therapy wouldn't work right up right up front, you know. And um, I said, okay, let me give you a few referrals. And I called the psychiatrist, and the least I got was 100,000 naira. And I'm like, wait, what? And here's the thing, and we all have to be honest about it. If we're seated in this room, then we're probably more privileged than maybe 70% of Nigerians. And I'm thinking, if I can't afford this, then what do people at the grassroots have as their options? And that is the reality. And that is the reality of mental health care in Nigeria. There's really nothing at the primary health care level. Let's not even try to quote it with little outreaches here and there that really don't do anything because there's really nothing at the primary health care level. So that's why people have to wait till, you know, sadly, things get really, really extreme and then they come to tertiary care. So as somebody who has used the service and who has also been someone who has provided services, I feel like with everything we need to do in Nigeria, we need to go back to the fact that we are, by latest statistics, the poverty capital of the world. We cannot be so dissociated with the grassroots that we only think that care, mental health care should be at one level of, you know, of the healthcare system. It's important that whatever kind of healthcare innovation that anybody wants to bring, you want to call it accessible and disruptive and whatever, if it doesn't cater to the grassroots, then you're not really doing anything in Nigeria because people at the grassroots do not have options. They don't. We only hear what we hear on social media. It's, it's still so, some sort of privileged information. You need to go into and really hear what people are having to deal with in terms of mental health. There is nothing for them. So that's why, of course, you would see people gladly take their family members to some of these um, religious camps of some sort where they get chained and flogged and their backs get cut because or sometimes they drill their skulls because the evil spirit needs to come out and all of those horrific things and still nothing. You know, so it's, it's for me, it's a very fragmented system. It's okay, go to a psychiatric hospital, but then who wants to be associated with a psychiatric hospital? And that's why we see a lot of countries, or at least a few countries that are setting an example of slowly closing down psychiatric hospitals and moving those kinds of systems of some sort into communities where it's like a community health center, where everybody goes to get something. Nobody may know what you're there for, but everybody gets some sort of help cl as close enough to home as possible. You know, so those are things that we would I mean, of course, we may not have the infrastructure, which we do have primary health care centers. If we use them and we sort of innovate beyond them, I believe that there is something in there for us to use because they are already existing structures. No one is saying we need to go and build new structures to be community health centers. We have primary health care centers. So there's so much more that needs to be done in mental done. health care. Thank you very much for that. Um, just to add a rejoinder um, so that the hospital Yaba would not be stigmatized as much as it is, they opened a bar inside it. Um, <laughs> yes. So, I mean, that's the best they could do, actually. Um, Prof, you, you work in the UK, you've worked in the UK for about 40 years plus, and um, I'm sure you, you can give us very simple and basic steps that the Nigerian system can do or, you know, start to do to improve the mental health service. I'm, I'm sure we, the crowd would like to hear from you, sir. So, um, thank you. I, 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 it's always helpful sometimes to just have facts, you know. And it's, I'm sure some people in the room who've heard me speak before, I'm preoccupied with facts, because we can sometimes just talk, and a lot of, as, uh, as Obama says, you know, we're just shooting breeze, you know. So, so I think sometimes facts help. The, um, how much do we spend? 
on health, not on mental health, on health in Nigeria in comparison to other countries. So the per capita spend in Nigeria is 97 US dollars per head of population. The per capita spend in the UK is 4,192 US dollars. And in the US is 9,892 US dollars. So, so those figures are very helpful. You just, it just helps just to know what we're discussing. And, and if you were preoccupied with what the percentage of the GDP is, because that gives you a better sense of what, you know, whether the, uh, you know, if you're a poor country, whether you're actually spending a reasonable amount given how much you, your, your country is worth, the uh, Nigeria spends 3.65% of its GDP on health. And uh, that's the same as Benin, you know, what used to be called Dahomey. And Burkina Faso, which is regarded as a very poor country, spends 6.75. That's twice as much as Nigeria does on its health care. And the UK, like the, the rest of Western Europe, they spend approximately 10% of their GDP on health care. And the US, for no better effect, spends 17%. So we're not asking Nigeria to spend 17%, but they ought to start to approximate at least half of what the, uh, what, what the Western world spend on it. Now, the reason for doing all that hard work of going back to look at the data and see what the WHO has to say about it is that your, your, systems are to your system's totally dependent on how much you have. So you can't, we can't just talk in, the, uh, kind of, in a kind of abstract manner over these matters as if we can have anything. So we, the, the, the resources in Nigeria are absolutely pitiable. They're just, um, they're just terrible. Um, well, actually, we don't know what the resources in Nigeria are because the Nigerian government is one of the few governments in the world that don't do their returns. So the WHO page for Nigeria is blank. All right? They, have, they haven't done their returns. In other words, you guys, you're paying your taxes and these guys are sitting in Abuja, working in the Ministry of Health, and they're not doing their work. They're not filling the forms in and sending it to Geneva. All right? So some people here who are journalists should be writing about that. So, so, so I'm using the, um, the summation of the uh, lower middle income countries to represent what I think Nigeria's resources are like. I suspect that that is probably an exaggeration of what the resources are like in this country. So, so the, one of the things to keep in mind is that um, we have, if you think of uh, Birmingham as a city of a million people, it has a hundred consultant psychiatrists. That's a senior level people. And these consultant psychiatrists, just for the city of Birmingham, uh, you have a general psychiatrist, perinatal psychiatrists, psychotherapists, forensic psychiatrists, addiction psychiatrists. So it gives you an idea of the complexity and the extraordinary richness of the system. The whole of Nigeria, of a population of 170 million people, have less than 100 psychiatrists. All right, so, so I, I say that just to emphasize that just the one city has 100 senior psychiatrists, whereas the whole of Nigeria that has 100, 170 million people has barely the same number of psychiatrists who are practicing in just one city. So that gives you an idea of the incredible kind of, um, just it, it, the, the resources I just don't, aren't present. So that means that you have to be extraordinarily creative in order to try to find a way to provide services, not just for the elites, not just for the people in this room, but a service which goes right across the country. And if you then go back and think of what happens in the 60s, so in the 60s, when we still had a relatively reasonable country, there, there was a, a, a WHO a kind of draft system that designed the idea that you will have a, 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 a local medical service which was designed for between 25 and 50,000 people. 
And in Nigeria, they've only developed the, um, the experimental system for in Igora, and they've never replicated it anywhere else. And the idea was, in that system, it will fit in and will have uh, a district hospital where the people who need to go to a district hospital will go to, which will be for a relatively larger district, and the people who then need tertiary services will go from, uh, uh, from, from the district hospital to the teaching hospitals. Now, all of this are very simple, wonderful to write on a piece of paper, and you could make it happen if you had the reasonable people running the country, people who do their jobs. So, so, so at one level, there's not enough money, there are not enough resources, there are not enough trained personnel. At the other level, you could make things work a little bit better if you only had people who were determined to drive through the things that need to be done. Thank you very much, sir. Um, I know the audience has a lot of questions, so I don't intend us to just continue to banter. I want responses. Um, and please make your responses as short as possible. Questions will also be entertained. I need someone to um, go around with a roving mic. Um, the gentleman in white. Please keep your responses very short. Two minutes at the most. I will. Um, I cannot speak to Christianity, but in Islam, under the umbrella of Usul al-Fiqh, scholars like Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Qayyim al josiyah these are medieval scholars, have written treatises that have acknowledged um, the prevalence of mental health, that have acknowledged issues like dementia and depression. And very recently, others like Sheikh Nizami um, have argued that there is no concept of possession by the jinn. It's equally a mental problem, and we need to address it as such. It was just to clarify. Because you mentioned religion earlier. Oh, well, did they offer any treatment? <laughs> no, they're not psychiatrists, sadly. <laughs> Thank you very much. Please, the lady in brown. Or wearing the brown um, stuff. Yeah, I want to ask, there's been research showing a link between cannabis and uh, psychosis. And uh, I wonder what is uh, um, the situation here in Nigeria with regard to uh, the, um, the drugs and the psychosis. Yes, thank you very much for that question. I'll just take three questions. Um, lady in front here. Nicole. Yes. Hi. So my question is, um, what's being done to um, destigmatize mental illness? Because um, there was mention about um, a, a having health clinics so that people could walk in within their communities. But um, if people are still not um, you know, ashamed of, of having mental illness, then what, what's being done publicly to really destigmatize mental illness? We'll take another question and then, or we'll take two more questions and then we'll come back here. Hi. Hi. My name is Ibi Fubara. I'm a psychologist. Okay. Um, it's funny we talked about your psychiatric hospital here because I worked when you were there. So um, my question is for mental health practitioners. So while I, I'll be fast. while I was at Yaba, um, a couple of things happened to me. Um, I was harassed by a member of the staff, a psychologist, a, my supervisor. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask, um, is there anything in place for women like me that um, I was an intern, I was young? some years ago, and I went there, but I didn't feel safe, and I do not ever want to go back to work there. So is there anybody that kind of protects people like me that wants to work in a psychiatric hospital but wants to feel safe? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Then the last question, um, the, um, the lady in the, uh, um, the Thank you very much. Okay, so I spent about six weeks in um, teaching hospital in OAU, and something happened to me where I um, I was very upset. It was my first day there, and I was very upset. I was very hysterical. And what they did was that they tied me up, and it was a very traumatic experience for me because I, it sort of took me back to things that happened to me before. And I want to ask, is this like typical... Um, Protocol um, protocols in hospitals generally, do they do this to people? And why does it um, still persist? And I just, if you can explain that to me, is this normal? Thank you very much. Thank you for question. Um, I guess there are questions for everybody on the table, as it were. Um, we could start with the, the cannabis and psychosis and the Nigerian experience. Um, yeah, yeah. I want to speak to that. Um, I, I'm not, uh, I haven't worked in Nigeria for 40 years, so I, I'm, I'm not sure what the current situation was. Um, I just talk in general terms. And um, 
uh, and it's a, it's a funny it's a funny subject because in uh, in uh, in America cannabis is uh, decriminalized and legal and there's a push in this in the British system as well to make it uh, legal and to, to decriminalize it um, and and when I first went to the UK I used to find my colleagues who are, you know who are doctors like myself had a very interesting um, views about cannabis and I had to remind them that um, cigarette smoking in Nigeria when I was a boy a person will smoke one cigarette all day and, and um, take two puffs and then nip it at the top and put it in behind his ears. And, and it was when I went to the UK that I found people who smoked 50 cigarettes a day. Because in Nigeria, if you're really a smoker, you're smoking one, two, or three cigarettes a day. Now, in the UK, the middle classes who I was working with, they thought they were smoking cannabis because they had passed one tote amongst 12 or 13 people at a party. Whereas the people smoking cannabis in Aro, in Abelkota, when I worked in Aro, they were smoking cannabis like fella Ransom Kuti smoked cannabis, wrapped in a newspaper and a big, big, you know, not, and they're smoking several of that a day. So, so you got to get out of your mind this idea that uh, smoking cannabis in a middle class Britain is the same as smoking cannabis in, uh, you know, in inner city, inner city Lagos. They're totally different things. Um, all I want to say is that um, we know that if you were to start, it's, a, it's not an opinion, it's a fact, that if you were to start to smoke cannabis, before the age of 14, when your brain is developing, we know that it's likely to do you a lot of harm. So, so that's the first thing to say. The second thing to say is that we also know that it depends on whether you're, uh, you know, in, in medical terms, what we call a, a fast or a slow metabolizer. So if you're a fast metabolizer, you smoke cannabis and your, 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 your liver clears it. Even before you finish smoking, it's cleared out of your system. If you're a, if you're a slow metabolizer, it accumulates in your body. All right, so two things you need to know. If you will want to smoke cannabis and you want to remain well, go and have your gene type tested. And if you're a fast metabolizer, you'll be fine. And definitely, if you've got children, you have to ensure that they don't start smoking before the age of 14. All right? So, so but it, it, would be, it would be stupid to think that it wasn't harmful. It's as stupid to think that drinking alcohol is not harmful. I mean, why would you want to think that it wasn't going to be harmful? Something which is, uh, has psychotropic properties. So, so we just accept that it is harmful. And, but that's never stopped human beings from using it. And it's not about to stop them, given that I've just said it. So I think all we want to do is how you modify the risk that you carry. That's all I would say about it. Regarding the question about destigmatization, I mean, oh, okay. I mentioned earlier that we have a, a bar in, in Yaba Psychiatric Hospital. Yeah, it's, it's baby steps. No, no step at all. <laughs> um, I believe. I strongly believe that destigmatization, again, is about the narrative. And because we took in the stigma or the prejudice, however you want to look at it, from a place of condition and stories, it's important that we use those same medium or media to approach destigmatization. So for what we do in my organization is that we tell new stories. So we don't go out most of the time to say, oh, this is what mental health is, this is what mental illness is, one in five, one in four, all fantastic, but those are statistics. When we humanize mental health and mental health conditions, fear is, is what drives all of those things, and the fear goes away. 
So when you come in contact with someone who lives with a mental health condition and then you know the person's life, oh, the person is doing well, she's taking medications, she does her therapy, she's... You don't know it by yourself, but something is beginning to shift within you. And then all of a sudden, you relax a lot more. That, oh yeah, somebody has a mental health condition, yeah, that's okay. Like I know somebody who, yeah, she seems to be doing fine. So that's the tool we use. It's about t just letting people just talk about their experiences and creating safe spaces that people can talk about it. You know, ensuring that people who may not necessarily identify as people who may have mental health conditions are in those spaces as well. So that you interact with everybody and everybody sees that. It just, it really could be any of us, you know. And it's important that, you know, people who we hold in high regard, people who sort of are influential, are also people who get to be vulnerable about you know, many of these experiences because it's really not that far. You know? I always tell every single person, you know somebody who lives with a mental health condition. I'm like, no, 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 I'm like, you know. And if you don't know, maybe you're the one. The statistics, one in six, one in four, one in six, I mean, it's obvious. I mean, it's, I mean, well, we all know somebody, trust me. Regarding the, the question about what happened to you, I'm really sorry for what happened. But the, the, the step to take would be to report to the line manager, which in, in, in my understanding would be the head of um, clinical service. But I mean, that, that would not make you, I don't know how much, how much that would go, but you also need to, I mean, talk about what has happened to you within a safe space so that you would, I mean, begin the process of healing from the experience. Um, and that also goes as well to you. I think it's important to report what has happened to you. Um, and talk about how you felt about it and also to find your own healing first and foremost because that's really what is most important. I just um, want to, I just want to add want something to, to it and it's so important because here's the thing, even if you reported, like I said, our legislation, the legislation we currently run with allows for them to tie you up. That's the truth. And that's why I keep saying we can all advocate individually, we can all try and plug in the gaps at the grassroots and all of those well-meaning things, but we're capped by policy. That's the truth. So if we do not go and address the fact that in the current Nigerian mental health bill that you're trying to pass now, they still, they still allow for restraints and for them to force you and irreversible treatments and though a very dicey topic, that you don't have legal capacity, all of those things, if we don't begin to have those conversations, then more and more people are going to fear even going to seek help because, hey, you just went in and maybe, yes, at that point in time, maybe you were experiencing something. But I assure you there are other ways to go about it than the way we tend to lazily do it in the Nigerian system. And I tell you that for somebody who has gone through a similar experience as well. You do not hold people down just like that. You don't just tie people down. They inject you. They give you things. No. It is a violation of a fundamental human right. That is the truth. You know, it is in contradiction with Nigeria as a state party in the United Nations Conventions of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. You do not get held down. That is the truth. You don't get put into restraints. You don't get locked up. You don't, your possessions don't get to be taken away from you. It is not right. But the thing is that it goes on. And it is so normal. Walk into any psychiatric hospital undercover or whatever, you will see it happen before your eyes. So we can have these conversations and then we can say goodbye, but the truth is that we need to fix our legislation. If not, we're all at risk of something. You're very right about that, and that's why this panel discussion is important, and that's why we in this room have to organize. A lot of things have been said here that can trigger you already. I mean, <laughs> I'm triggered actually by this conversation already. And I think that, I mean, organization is really the first step that we can take towards, um, towards getting what we really need and deserve. Um, we'll take two more, three more questions. Um, I haven't taken a question from here, so I'll take the lady, the spectacle lady in front here. Um, I'll take Wura as well. <laughs> Wura has been waiting. And then I'll take, um, the um, yeah, the fair skinned man. I, I missed you, I'm sorry. Uh, if there's enough time, then we'll consider your question as well. Please, let's make it short so that everybody can, you know, be a sorry. part of it. My name is Shala. Um, when I was growing up, <clears throat> they sent me to go to someone's house. She had just had twins to help her out. And then very suddenly, I was taken away, and the pastor is there doing marathon deliverance prayer. And they're asking me if um, she ever hurt the children. And they tell me that she was possessed and she wanted to hurt her children. And then it's only when you get older that you realize that she had postpartum, <laughs> you know, depression, and that's what she, she went to go seek guidance on, and that's the treatment she got. 
So my question is, as a lay person, when you see these kind of scenarios, what can you really do to stoke that kind of conversation in a religious context or cultural context where you might be the only person speaking that way? Thanks for the question, um, Wura. Straight to Wura. Or maybe people should come out to ask this question so that we don't we, we spend less time um, sending the mic on errands. Thank you. Um, very enlightening um, discussion. I just wanted to ask, um, like you said, um, a lot of people do not have access to mental health services. So um, are there some tips on how to provide support to people with mental health uh, problems? No. So um, I live with someone that has, and uh, not depression, maybe, I don't know, like serious ones, but um, she can't go to the hospital. So how can you uh, provide support in that instance? And then also try to, how can you get people to not stigmatize um, further? Because a lot of things go around and then people change their behavior. And I just um, need some ideas on how to better. That's fine. Um, Thank the, you. the gentleman in the middle there, whose uh, hand is quite fair. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, I wish to inquire um, how much of, because me, most of the time social media plays a role nowadays in comparing ourselves with each other, which brings, which brings a lot of pressure and a lot of um, uh, what depression in, in a sense because of materialistic ways. How much do you think social media is playing um, a role in, in terms of a lot of depression nowadays? Uh, please, can you be a bit more specific? What, what, what exactly are you asking? Social media and depression? Yes, yes, okay. social media in depression, because a lot of comparison with each other because of okay. material, this person okay. is this, and That's so That's fine, forth. thanks for, for the question. So, Let's start with uh, would you answer the question regarding um, Perinatal, um. <laughs> okay, so take the question you want to take, the um, Wura's question, um, question regarding support and um, mental health services for people who are... Okay, yes, uh, support, that's what I can, I can get from it. Um, so I'll take it in two folds. One is that when we talk about support or self-help, so sometimes people would ask, oh, I'm suicidal, can you give me some tips? And then I'm like, no, no tips. Let's go and seek proper you know, mental health care. So on the one hand, it's understanding that these things are not substitutes. They're supposed to complement. You know, I recognize that, again, in our society, there isn't enough to go around in terms of mental health care. But I also say that there is something for everyone. So in terms of financial capacity or whatever it is, there is something. There are general hospitals, there are teaching hospitals, there are some military hospitals, there are some federal medical centers, then psychiatric hospitals. So if you don't want to go to a psychiatric hospital, there are actually other places that you can get you know, some sort of yeah, mental health service. So um, I just wanted to clear that out so that it's not that we are just trying to slap a bandage on, you know, a bleeding wound, because that is, I find, it happens a lot of the time, and it's very problematic, because you're just delaying something, and then the inevitable happens. Um, but now, on the other hand, assuming that the person is already receiving some sort of help or some sort of support, and you just want to give that home friendly, you know, very personal kind of support. I would say, and perhaps you don't hear this enough, ask the person what support looks like for them. So I'll give an example. When I was in a very, very dark place the very first time, because I've, I've had relapses, um, you know, people try and, you know, will do what they think support is, and it used to get me so irritated, because nobody ever thought to just say, what do you want? I really just wanted someone to sweep my room. Like, it was dirty, and nobody was sweeping it. Like, you guys are bringing me food, and I don't want to eat. Just sweep my room and move me, dress the bed, move me the other way. And that was what support looked like for me, you know. Don't call me when visitors come. I don't want to see anybody. <laughs> you see, some people are saying yes. Like, they know, you know. So people do know sometimes, you know, what support looks like for them. So ask. Just ask the person, what would you like me to do? You know, and I know it can be hard 
loving or caring for somebody who has a mental health condition. It may prove very problematic because we're not conditioned to know how that dynamic should work. Um, but I assure you, asking can be a good thing. Then sometimes give people space. We just want to all be like saviors, like you just choke the person, like what you want, let me do this, let me like, allow me now, like, it's okay, you know? So you might give me space, but don't go away. That's where the problem is. So sometimes people just get upset, like, hey, whatever, I try to help her. How can somebody want to be? And then you don't even help yourself. Rubbish. And they walk away. Okay, that's you push the person further inside. I, I, want, I, don't, I don't want us to not answer the other questions. Okay, so that's support. <laughs> um, yes, I, I, I think I'll just, um, just deal with uh, postpartum psychosis very, very, very quickly. So the thing to say about it is that it occurs in one in 500 births. So it's not common, but it's common enough not to be rare, if you see what I mean. So that's the first thing to say about it. The second thing to say about it is that um, it occurs, it peaks day three or day four. So it occurs very quickly after childbirth. And so the 80% uh, of uh, postpartum psychosis would have occurred within the fourth day of childbirth. And the, and the graph goes down so that the rest occur well before 28 days. Um, so in the good old days when uh, women were in hospital for seven to 10 days postpartum, practically all cases would have arisen whilst the person was in and they would have been identified and treated very promptly. Uh, but um, in today's world, people aren't in the hospital for that long, so it's, the kind of problem that you're describing is much more likely because it's occurring when they are at home. It's starting, and most people don't know what it is and, and, and so on. But, but um, it's uh, eminently treatable. I, I, uh, I don't know the actual figures in my head, and I should, uh, but I think practically everybody recovers. So even though it is very disruptive to the mother-baby bonding and so on, properly treated, the mother will recover. So, so it's not one of these conditions where we might be worried about whether the person is going to have a chronic illness forever or anything of that sort. So, so from that point of view, it's quite, uh, if one's going to have a nasty disease, it's actually a good nasty disease to have because you're likely to recover. I think that um, it gives me the opportunity to then say a little bit about perinatal psychiatry because I, I used to myself work in that area. So it allows us to talk about the fact that um, for one in 10 or one in 13 women, you're likely to have uh, postpartum depression after childbirth. And, and living in the kind of country that we live in in Nigeria, it's not likely to be recognized um, so that people need to be aware uh, of the of the fact that this is uh, this is likely, so if I might ask answer the other question, which is the question about uh, social media, um, it's it's a long protracted answer. So I think the best thing to do is to catch me on the way out. But all I want to do is use the opportunity to to mention a term, and the term which is a, become a term of art that you might want to Google is status anxiety. So status anxiety is a term that people are starting to use, which is a, a term which goes back to this idea that we human beings are social animals, that when we come into a room, we are very, very quickly looking and trying to find where we are in the social pecking order. And that social media, Instagram, for example, has accentuated the anxiety that humans have about trying to fit, to know where they are in that pecking order. And of course, for women, uh, a lot of it is to do with appearance. So that there's a lot of anxiety about whether one looks as well as one ought to. And, and the young women, um, and I see I used to do a lot of work with young university students, and the young women are sending selfies to their friends first thing in the morning, and they're determining their inner life, their sense of uh, well-being is being determined by whether or not they get a like, or whether they get two likes, or whether they get a nasty comment, and so on. So, and that, of course, that early, very, very first in the morning, that um, kind of uh, attack on the self can then carry on through the rest of the day. 
and so on. So, so there's a lot of work on this. Uh, the, the business about so status anxiety goes well beyond uh, social media, which is why I said you want to catch me on the way out. Thank you. I think we have come to the end of the um, give, give yourself a round of applause for staying to the end. Um, we are going to stay around to answer questions. And I think that we should not just have a conversation here. We should take this beyond this conversation here and do something different today regarding mental health. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you.